So this is the first in a series of product discovery meetups. And uh, personally, I'm really excited to do this. And uh, we have about 90 people joining. So this is uh, overwhelming, to be honest, uh, that so many of you have uh, joined. And the purpose of these meetups is to bring more clarity to what product discovery actually means. Um, and to share thoughts, tools, and methods on how we can shape this uh, methodology together. And with us today, I have three people who are at the forefront when it comes to product discovery, I believe, in Sweden. This is my words. And uh, I'm very excited to have them today uh, to share their um, ideas, thoughts, case studies, etc. So with us today, we have Martin Christensen, uh, who's an Agile UX coach at Syncton. And we have Johanna Olander, who's a product owner at SVT. And then we have Victor Sasan, who's an agile and organizational coach. And my name is Marcus Kastenfors, and I will be your host. So I will post questions to the presenters later on. Okay. And the schedule, um, so a brief introduction. Um, and then we're going to kick off the presentation. So Martin will start, and then Johanna, and then Victor. And then we're going to end with a Q&A session. So we're going to use Slido, as I mentioned before, where you can post questions. And I will read those questions and post them to um, the presenters. OK? So the first question that I want to pose to you guys um, is, what is product discovery? And um, the word clouds, we'll see what types of words that you use to, to talk about what product discovery is. And if you're new and just joined, so you can go to slido.com, you can enter pd-meetup or take a photo of the QR code that you see on the screen. So validated learning, working out what to develop, understanding, learning, learning, the right product. A method, building, right product. Oh, it's a lot of stuff happening. Now we have 93 people. Welcome, everyone. So, Martin, Victor, Johanna, what kind of patterns are you seeing here? It's a lot of learning, exploration, no the user's problem. What else do we see, Victor? I think, so all of this to me says like building empathy. Mm -hmm. um, so listening, like what Johanna said, learning, um, but in the end, like really truly understanding what it is that the customer is going through. And Martin, what, uh, what patterns are you seeing? People are using the same words as I had in my presentation. So that's, uh, I really like that. Uh, I, saw, I, saw in the I saw in the beginning, someone wrote uh, building the right thing. Mm. Uh, and uh, from what I can see, I can see it goes a little bit outside just building empathy. Uh, it's also understanding the ecosystem in different ways. Mm. Cool. But thank you very much for answering that question. Uh, I have another one. Um, so what's the biggest challenge doing product discovery in your organization? So leadership buy-in, skills, time, resources, limited understanding of value, or too much focus on delivery? Just to get a sense of what, what you guys are feeling. Too much focus on delivery. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, limited understanding of values catching up here. So, um, guys, what, what are your thoughts when you see these results? The main thing I usually hear when I'm coaching teams in this is that we don't have the resources or the time. Mm. 
Uh, and I really believe that it's that people rather have focus on delivery and have a limited understanding of value. Mm. So. What do you think, Victor? Well, what do you, how do you interpret the result? So I don't want to get into my presentation too soon. <laughs> um, so I think I will be talking a lot about this in my, in my, in my presentation. And Johanna, any thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree. I, <laughs> it's much focus on delivery. Right. Get to know the user's problem. Mm. Great. So, without further ado, our first speaker for the evening, Martin Christensen. Um, uh, the floor is yours. I'll stop sharing my screen. Uh, so, let's give Martin a warm welcome. Thank you. I'm just going to show my worth here by knowing how to share my screen. I think there we go. <coughs> Hopefully. So yeah, someone already wrote building the right thing. Uh, and that's what I'm uh, going to start talking about. And uh, my view on our discovery uh, is um, that it's pretty holistic. You have to think about a lot of aspects to do a really good uh, product discovery to actually learn uh, what you need to learn uh, so that you don't waste your resources or time or whatever. And it actually gives value to use the words that Marcus had written. Um, so let's start with me, a little bit egocentric. Uh, I am an agile UX coach. And mentor. Uh, I've been a UX designer, UX researcher mainly, uh, but I've transitioned into being more of a coach. Uh, and I have the benefit of doing this in a lot of different settings, settings, different domains, different companies. Uh, and I've seen some patterns. <laughs> so those patterns is what I'm going to talk about mainly today. Uh, <clears throat> And I want, would, would, would uh, sorry, speech failure. Uh, I would like to, uh, to uh, help you to see what I've seen, to see the patterns as well, uh, and be able to uh, um, recognize those patterns before uh, they occur. Um, so I've created a little tool that I've been using for, for a few years, four years, I think, something like that. And I will share that tool with you today. That's the plan. So I'm going to start with uh, now it's an old story. It's a 10 year old story, I think, at the moment. Uh, <clears throat> when I was working as a UX designer uh, back in 2010, we worked uh, with a specialized analytics tool. Uh, and I saw a few of you who worked with me or in this meetup today. So let's see if you have the same experiences I had 10 years ago. So uh, our business owner came to us and gave us a clear business goal. Uh, we had like, we're, we're going to earn money in this way, specific way. Uh, <clears throat> and I was user-centered designer then, so I did my user-centered design and interviewed users, did personas, created prototypes, tested them out, etc. And I had a really, really good team of agile developers. Uh, I actually did, don't, didn't understand back then how good they were. So uh, they actually worked in a really, really good way. And we got feedback early. And uh, uh, throughout the development, we saw that the users were really happy. So that was good. And then the release day came and nobody wanted to buy the tool from us. We were like, okay, so what's at fault here? What did we miss in this? And so we went back to, uh, to the business owner and, and kind of asked, so who are the customers? Have you done your research beforehand to, to see if people actually wanted to buy things? Is there a market gap here? 
and uh, that person admitted that no that hadn't been done and we just assumed that it had um, and this made this company uh, they, they 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 got a real big problem with this um, because now they've invested uh, money and time to uh, build this tool and uh, people wanted to use it but their managers and uh, uh, people who were responsible for buying software didn't want to pay up for it basically and i think this has happened to you as well um, similar things and we started thinking why did this happen really and a few years back i realized that this is because we have a lot of biases we think that we know stuff for instance this was this is an exact quote actually uh, uh, one of the managers says well i know exactly what the customers want because i was a customer myself uh, and this is something that's pretty well known called confirmation bias. This was probably the main thing that, that was our problem when we built that analytics tool. But we also heard people saying, well, it's not hard to build a great product. Just add developers or just add designers or just work and it will be great. Um, and this is another bias which makes you a little bit blind uh, to the situation um, around you. You feel that this is a good endeavor to, to bark upon. So uh, uh, I'm optimistic and we will do this in a very good way. It's not hard. A third bias uh, that a lot of people have is, I think this is the delivery focus that we saw a little bit of before. If we just build it, people will buy it. So you value output over the actual outcome. Uh, you look at the features, you uh, specify your user stories and, and well, go ahead and build it and everything will be fine. So these were just a few suggestions. I bet there are a lot of them uh, out there and I bet you have seen a lot of these as well. So I started thinking about how can we mitigate this? Uh, so what is building the right thing? What does that actually mean? Well, for instance, it means that we look at the outcome, the impact, uh, and we do that by really understanding the problem. And by doing that, understanding the problem, understanding the context with where, uh, which the product should be used in and what the market is, etc., we will mitigate a few of those biases we'll uh, replace them with research, basically. But research, we don't have time for research. Yeah, but you will need to have time for research to build the right thing. And if we have the same uh, scientific approach to, uh, to looking at the solutioning, uh, then we can, uh, get lower waste and raising the effectiveness by making sure the solution actually fits the problem. So my standard question, which a few of you have heard before, is does this solution actually solve the problem? Uh, and just by asking those questions, um, we mitigate more biases. We question ourselves. And this is what I see as discovery. This is the discovery phase asking all these tough questions and, and doing the research, basically. Uh, I said before that I think that for discovery is a bit more holistic. And I saw that some of you also agreed on, on that. Um, and this is uh, IDEO coming up with, or it's actually older than that coming up with that. The right outcome you get from looking at both the user's perspective, the business perspective, and the actual technical or practical feasibility perspective, then we get the right outcome. So uh, not only looking at giving it, taking empathy for the user or, or similar, that's one huge part of it, but just a third of it. 
And if we look at that part, the user perspective, we have a lot of methods going on. Uh, this is one of them called the double diamond. Uh, this, is a, this has a heritage since the 60s from participatory design, etc. cetera. Um, and it's all about finding the right problem and finding the right solution to that problem. Uh, and you do that by uh, <coughs> digging into uh, researching the situation, researching if the problem, if the solutions actually solve the problem, and it's a lot of connecting with the users along the way. So I looked at this, and I divided it up into four stages, which other people also have done, but I na named mine a little bit differently, so I tweaked it a bit. I call them explore for a first phase to explore the. Uh, situation that we're in, the context, then we need to structure this uh, in some good problem definition or similar, uh, analyze uh, what we have found, and then we want to innovate, innovate in our solution, ideate, etc. And we need to validate our um, different solutions that we, we uh, came up with in the innovation phase to make sure that they solve the right problem, basically. Uh, and then I was like, OK, so this is a UX method, which takes care of the user value. Hasn't anyone done something similar when it comes to, to the business value? But perhaps I looked around, asked some business analysts, but I didn't really find anything. And I was like, shouldn't this be for the technical part as well or the practical part like is there an hr process looking similar for for uh, making sure you have the right competencies uh, is there a, a technical method for researching that we know the problem space and we know the solution space we know what architectures will be good right now etc and didn't find anything actually might have been me uh, being really bad at looking around um, but I thought, yes, OK, let's, let's use this method and combine it with those three qualities from IDEO. So I came up with this holistic product discovery framework, I call it, which is a 12, uh, 4 by 3 matrix, basically, giving you 12 cells to fill in, uh, looking at business value, user value, feasibility uh, from all these perspectives. Exploring the problem, structuring problem, innovate solutions, validate solutions. And over the years, I realized that this has helped me tremendously. Um, so what I'm basically doing now is trying to share this with you and hoping that it will help you as well. And a good thing with this is that it's useful for so many things. For instance, this is what I would say is the essence of product discovery. So only by having this framework, you can convince people, managers, et cetera, that, oh, here's a framework. We need to do this. And it's, hey, guys, it's for the business, it's for the users, and it's for, for the organization in general, if we have the, the capability. So it's a really good angle to use it like this. Another angle is that you can ask powerful questions in each of those boxes. This is just an example, but for instance, uh, we would have benefited from asking, what is our market landscape? Is there a, a market fit somewhere for our specialized analytics tool, for instance? But we never asked that question. So this is really helpful as well. Um, I need to say, though, that these are my examples. Uh, your powerful questions might look differently in your setting, but uh, here's an example anyway. Another angle is, or two other angles, is the historic or present angles. Uh, and if we go through the, the story from before, uh, we got a clear business goal, which I would place in structured problem for the business value. And then I started interviewing users. I started exploring problems on the user value part. I structured the data I got from that, which uh, back then I did personas. Um, 
And then I didn't innovate. I only did one solution actually. And this is another bias uh, called the IKEA effect uh, <clears throat> that you can run into as a designer or something. When you've built something the first time, when you've done a prototype or sketch or something, you fall in love with, with uh, the thing that you built because you have built it. And it's really hard to actually do more solutioning if you don't have the method. And I didn't. So only one solution. Sorry about that. But then I did testing on this with users. And as I said before, we found that people were happy. Um, the developers did good iterative development. So we found different ways of solving this. And we got feedback from a very good continuous delivery cycle as well. So we got instant validation from the users, the beta users, that this was what I wanted. But when we tried to validate solutions, from a business perspective, we had no customers. And the fault was that it was a made up market gap, basically. Uh, so that's the historic angle. The present angle is that hmm, we have some parts that where we should do more work here. Only one solution, which probably branch out to several solutions. We have some gaps here as well, three unmarked holes. What should we do there? How can we cover this in a good way to mitigate the risk of uh, falling into the bias trap, basically? So I'm mostly using this as the guide angle, a guide. Uh, so I'm starting somewhere uh, with my teams. For instance, let's go have stakeholder interviews to explore the business value. Uh, and then we can have user interviews to explore the, the user value. And we can structure them together in a workshop, et cetera. And I go back and forth here as the design squiggle shows us that it's a lot of work uh, early in the exploration discovery part before we go into solutioning. So this is the angle I mostly use, uh, but all, the others are also very good to have. If you're interested in more angles, here's the shameless plug. Uh, me and Marcus are actually uh, writing a book, which is called Product Discovery, the no-nonsense guide for building unbeatable products and services. And what do you say, Marcus? It's out soon, right? Very soon, I hope. Um, yes, hopefully. <laughs> Uh, so summarizing this very quick talk is um, I bet that we all need to think a little before we act. And uh, for me, it's been helpful using a framework to remember thinking before acting. All right. And thank uh, you. thanks, Martin. And uh, I've been using this framework for, for years now, and it's been really helpful as a kind of a mental model to, to think about the entire picture of uh, product discovery. Um, so thank you for sharing that presentation. And next up, we have the pleasure to hear Johanna Olander talk about um, outcome-based roadmaps at SVT Play. So please um, join the stage, Johanna. Yes. And while we wait for things to set up, you can go to slido.com and you enter the code PD-meetup and you can post questions to the presenters that we can um, use in the Q&A section of this meetup. Yeah, okay. So uh, I'm going to tell you about how the SVT Play teams became more outcome driven. So this is kind of a case study, you could say. So first, a little context. Uh, this is SVT Play and it's a streaming service for the Swedish television. And we have five digital teams working on this service and one editorial teams. And those three teams, they have three strategic goals that they are working with. And during this year, all of the six teams are working with one of the goals, this one here in the middle. I didn't translate it, but I'm going to talk about it. And this goal um, 
here we want to become more relevant to the user and to measure that we wanted to see an increased retention so we wanted the user to to come more often to our product and uh, here's here was the main challenge for those six teams because they thought it was really hard to break down this kind of goal and they were working with experimentations and when you have this kind of goal it could take up to six months to see any change in this kind of goal so then it's really hard to work rapidly to work and to learn fast um, so we needed to do something because there was kind of, of a gap between what the teams were doing and those overall strategic goals. And since we didn't have any tactic, also the teams were focusing more on features or outputs instead of outcomes. So here's uh, when, where the outcome-based roadmap comes in. And uh, the structure of an outcome-based roadmap looks something like this. First, in the top, you have uh, the product vision and the strategic goals. And then you have the outcomes and the opportunities. And this was the part that we were missing at the SBT Play teams. And the outcomes, they are the measurable change in the customer behavior, and they are directly tied to the strategic goals so if you achieve an outcome you hopefully <laughs> achieve a goal if you have the right outcome of course and uh, to set the outcomes you really need to know your users main problems their pain points their jobs to be done what what makes them come to the product and how can you really make the product relevant to them and then you work with your hypothesis and your experiments to, to, to see if uh, the problem was right and if you had set the right outcome and so on. But as you can see, all of uh, those levels, they are aligned. So I'm going just to show you an example here. Uh, it's, uh, I borrowed it from Melissa Perry. She's a lean UX coach and it's fictitious so she made it up but i think it's it's a really good example um and here you have let's see first you have the vision in the top and it's on uber so in 10 years uber will be the cheaper alternative to owning a car or taking the public transportation so it's a very bold vision and it's also very clear. So if you are working at Uber, and then you might see that hmm, in, some of our, in some of the cities, people aren't taking Uber. So then you can go out to those cities and see, in, maybe interview people and try to see what's the main challenge here? Why doesn't people take Uber? And maybe you see that, okay, it seems to be a long waiting time here. Let's dig in some data. And maybe you see that, okay, so there's only one driver for every 300 people. This could be the main problem that we uh, are going to work with. And then you set your uh, challenge or main strategic goal to reduce waiting time in those key cities to less than five minutes. And um, your outcome or target condition might be to have tests, to have one driver for every 50 people. And then you see if you could see a change, if people are more likely to take Uber in those cities. So here you see kind of the same structure as in the map you saw before but the vocabulary are a bit uh, different. But it's this kind of aligned that we want to see. Hmm. Okay, so then we did the same thing uh, with the SVT Play teams, uh, with the digital teams, 
and uh, we had a few workshops to identify the main problems and here we worked in cross-functional teams and we also invited people from marketing and from editorial and so on of course so and then we digged in the data to see if we could see a match between the outcomes and see the measurable change in those outcomes and we did a prioritization prioritization here as well of course and then we came up with this roadmap and it's very tiny text and you don't have to <laughs> read it actually but uh, i just wanted to show you the structure because um, here in the top we had a vision and a goal and we had them before and here in the middle it's the new part where we uh, overcame this gap and replaced it with outcomes and opportunities. So now our five team or six teams are working with those four areas here we can see at opportunities. And now they are, instead of looking at this overall goal, retention goal, they are now looking at the outcome level. Uh, and it's much easier for them to do some experimentation and get quick results and to, to move on and to see if any of those areas could, could help us to reach our overall strategic goal. So uh, it's been a big change. And now we have um, shared, we had the shared vision before, but now it's much clearer to the teams and since we have this new tactic uh, to work with and also the teams are working more on solving the customer problems and focus on outcomes instead of uh, features so this is one of the things that we've been working on with the SVT play teams but we also have a lot of other solutions as well to become more data driven so yeah that was my impression presentation thank you thank you so much Johanna for sharing that case study um, and please if you have questions for Johanna go to slido.com and uh, enter pd dash meetup um, as a code and you can enter the questions and we'll have those questions posed in the Q&A part of this meetup but now uh, we have the pleasure to introduce Victor Sassan who will uh, present uh, his thoughts around product discovery. So the floor is yours, Victor. Thank you, can you hear me? We can. Great, uh, my name is Victor. I work as, uh, I coach, I coach uh, organizations, uh, teams, Agile and product. We've been working with Agile for about 14 years. And I've been working with product discovery in different forms for almost a decade. Um, I was looking, thinking back in 2011 was the first time I could really say that I was working with it. And I've been working with a lot of different teams, uh, feature teams, uh, product teams, component teams, backend teams, frontend teams, project teams, virtual teams. And I've been thinking about like, why is it that I can see teams succeed at product discovery without any product coaches? And why is it that I can see teams fail with product discovery when there are coaches in the team. And so that's kind of when I started thinking about this and um, just like as a, just want to talk a little bit about the definition of, and I think you, you oops, my ticker is not working. No? Okay, so like what uh, Martin talked about and uh, like understanding the opportunities and ex uh, that exist or the problems that are present, fi figuring out a solution that matches those needs, like fitting this into an ecosystem, which you heard uh, Martin talk about as well, like figuring out how to scale this. And then like a last part, which is quite often forgotten is the ethics, like should we really be doing this? And so to me, when I talk about product discovery, like I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about all of this. And so I'm going to be sharing with you what like what it seems like to me. Um, and so a center part of my work is based around this. And this is Lewin's equation. Uh, it comes from Kurt Lewin. He was, an, uh, he was a psychologist in the early 1900s. Uh, he worked with social and organizational psychology. And a lot of his work can be summarized through this formula. And, the, and it's short for behavior is a function of the person in the environment. 
Now you can replace the behavior if you want to with the uh, performance. And just to give you a few examples of what this looks like. Um, well, actually the first thing is like, there seems to be, there's been a lot of discussion about like which of these two variables matters the most. Is it the P or is it the E? Because you can have two people in the same organization behaving in a completely different way. So the person matters, but you can also have the same person behaving in completely different ways in two different environments. So like, what is it that matters the most? Should we focus more on the individuals or should we focus more on the environment? And that's kind of like looking at a cube, which of these should we change in order to change the shape of the cube? But the consensus is that the environment matters more, but just how much more we don't know. So for today, that's just like, there's a slight advantage to the environment. But so let's look at a few examples. So if we throw in happy toddlers, I have two toddlers, or actually dressed toddlers. We just came out of winter and it was really hard to get them dressed sometimes. You know, there was fighting all the time. And my, my spouse and I, we have a little bit different approaches to this. She focused, she tends to have more focus on the P and I tend to have a little bit more focus on the E. And it might sound like, because I said that consensus says that E is and more effective at changing behaviors. It might sound like I'm saying that I, I am better at it, but I'm not. I would say that my spouse is be the better parent. But like, okay, so she focuses on the P and sometimes that works really well. I focus on the E and sometimes that work is, works really well. But in the end, who are we kidding? It's toddlers. So most of the times we're both wrong. Okay, but so like here's August, my son. He, he likes to run around in his t-shirt and his... Uh, flip-flops or, or ballerina shoes. When we want to get him dressed, like the environment that he is in is warm and cozy. So why would he want to get dressed? He's warm. But so we started thinking like, what if we change the environment? What if we open the door? Then it would be cold, wet and windy. And suddenly he started getting dressed. So we didn't need to fight with him. We didn't need to appeal to him as a person. We just needed to open the door and he would look out. He'd say, yeah, I don't want to go out in that in my t-shirt. So that's an example of expanding his environment. Another example is following the speed uh, rules. If we put that into this equation, like how do we get speed abiding citizens? So if we, if we think speed abiding citizens is a function of both the person and the environment that they're driving in. Okay, so the, the, the easiest way we, we, the first thing we do is we put up these speed signs and that works reasonably well in most cases, like kind of well. Most people will drive somewhere between 25 and 40. That's anecdotal. Um, you know, and what, if it's really important that people drive at 30, we might up the intervention. So we might put up a mirror. And so now you'd suddenly know that, okay, I'm driving too fast. So we change the environment. And if it's even more important, you might put up a speed camera. So you change the environment again, another intervention. And if that doesn't work, you might put up speed bumps or some, something, and you can't really drive faster because then you're gonna crash. Right? So you change the environment. You, you're not appealing to the person, you're appealing to the environment. So, you know, what if we put in product discovery in this formula? Like, what is product discovery a function of? And that's what I'm gonna be talking about for the rest of the talk. And so when I, when I work with organizations uh, and I talk to, I, I meet, it, and it depends on the size, if it's a startup scale up or like something that's already ongoing uh, with thousands of people. But like when we talk, when I talk to VPs, we, we start looking at the environment and what is the environment then? So I, 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 for me, it's like four areas that I think about. And we have management information, uh, approach to product management, and then the technical infrastructure. And if you get these kind of right, you get product discovery that happens naturally. That was my finding, right? So I, I would see these teams doing it without anyone telling them, without like any real prior knowledge to it, and they would just do it because it made sense for them to do it. So I was seeing these teams. Okay, but so what, are, what is the parts of management then? Well, so one is, and right now in this example, I'm mostly going to be thinking about like the product managers managers. So that would be like product executives and that could be a CPO or a VP depending on the size of the company. But so like, do, how do they coach and grow them? Do they work with growing their product managers to you know, focus on outputs or outcomes? That, that has a huge, um, impact on product discovery. The same goes for one-on-ones. What's happening in the one-on-ones? Like if I come to a, if I'm a direct and I come to my manager and he says, you know, I'd like you to show me your delivery plan. What are you going to be delivering? That's what I'm going to show him. 
But if he came and told me, hey, Victor, you know what? Tell me what are the experiments you're running and tell me why. What are you trying to prove? And how are you trying to do that? Now, these are just example roadmaps of a, a, a more traditional roadmap and then a more uh, the impact map, which focuses more on outcomes. But they can look anyway. They could even be a text file just. But that's going to change my behavior as a PM. Managers also have access to parameters that no one else has access to. So like, what's the stability like? What's the sa safety like? What's the product cohesiveness like? And it, here's just from a stability point of view, and product discovery is a really hard work to do. It requires you to compromise. It re requires you to explore things from multiple uh, perspectives. It, it, it forces you to look at really your biases, become aware of them, like uh, Martin talked about. And that's not an easy thing to do. And if you have teams whose competition, uh, composition changes every week or every month, you'd never get really that safety or understanding of the, the context you're operating within. Um, whoops. So, and uh, this picture is another picture of like, this is an organization I worked in and we looked at how many initiatives are people involved in? And we, we figured out that, hey, this might look like a, you, you have teams, but actually what's happening is that you have a project, uh, hidden project work. And when people are involved in like, this is one person and he wasn't involved in over 10 projects, he's not interested in discovery work. He just wants to know what to deliver and when. Right, so, so these things matter a lot. If we move on to information, you know, what, what information do they have access to? Do they have access, do team members, like do teams have access to what's happening financially? Do they know what the customer experience is like? Do they know what the churn reasons are? Do they get to listen in on customer service? Is there a dashboard they can access? But then also like, what's the integrity in that data? In, in some places you have, uh, depending on where you are in the company, you have completely different, uh, co sometimes conflicting data. And then taxonomy. One place I was in several years ago, long ago, they had uh, 20 different, well, 23 different definition of what a customer is, depending on where you are in the company. So that becomes really hard then to, you know, when you're reading something, what does it really mean? Is it encouraged to access data? And is it easily available? Because if it's not, people are not gonna access it. So this is also a part of the environment. Then when it comes to product management, we, we mostly think about like the strategy framework, the alignment framework, or how we prioritize things. And, how, and what is that? Like, do you follow, um, do you have some sort of framework like OKRs or the North Star framework or management of, by objectives? Or like, how are you making sure that your strategy is aligned? But also, like from a strategy point of view, is your strategy a plan, a delivery plan? Yes, this year we're going to deliver these four things. That doesn't leave a lot of room for product discovery. Whereas a strategy that sounds like this year we're going to focus on a personal experience, that leaves more room for discovery because then you're going to need to figure out how, what is product, uh, what is personalization or personal experience mean, and how do we really satisfy that? Product vision is there one? I mean, a real one that aligns, that's cohesive. Roadmap structure. This one tells a lot. You can, you can actually tell a lot about the culture by just looking at the team's different roadmaps. Are they, focused on, are they focused on dates and deliveries and dependencies? That talks a lot about the type of culture you're in and output culture. Or are they focused more on like, these are the goals we're aiming for, and this is how we're trying to achieve that, which focuses more on an outcome. Um, that's more on an outcome culture. The demos, you can also talk a lot about, the, or you can also spot a lot from the demos. Um, do people talk about what they have done or what they have learned? That talks a little bit about their um, status symbols. And in a culture where outputs is the status symbols, it's really hard shifting that. About a year ago, uh, John Cutler, he's a project, uh, product evangelist at Amplitude, he, he, he drew this and created this. And it's a product autonomy ladder. And at the top is less autonomy and at the bottom is more autonomy. And he, he doesn't criticize anything. He just says that like there's kind of work happening in all these levels at the same time in a company and you can be more in one place or more in one other place. And when I come to companies, if you're, if you're, if you're a company who expresses work this way to teams, you're, any effort you're trying to make is probably gonna be about increasing um, delivery autonomy. There's not a lot of product discovery happening here or it's happening outside like in an innovation team or an innovation center. Here is where you get a little bit more of the product autonomy. 
And here is the business autonomy. Like when you're actually giving teams potentially the right to change a, a pricing strategy or um, costs. If you're in a delivery org, a del delivery autonomy org, and you're, you want to go to product autonomy, that's a huge leap. And if you shoot in product discovery co coaches, which a lot of companies try to do into these teams that are in a delivery autonomy org, that's going to be the, the, all the product discovery that happens is really, really tied to the product discovery coaches. And it's really hard to take that over and then like integrate it and make it a part of their reality. Because there are so many uh, variables or parameters in the environment working against it. And I looked at this in a couple, I've looked at this in several different organizations. Here's one organization where we looked at like, what's your autonomy like? And here you might, like the first thing I thought about when I saw this was that, oh, okay, managers have more autonomy, team members have less. But in this organization, it was actually the longer you had stayed at the company, if you'd been there for five, six years, you had developed lots of relationships, you'd built up lots of credibility and you got to exercise more autonomy. I didn't work with them later on, so I don't know what's happened with this since. But here's another organization that I worked with for a little bit more than a year. And when we did this, we, we discovered that they were actually in a delivery autonomy org and they were trying to make the shift from delivery or autonomy work to a product autonomy work. And so we worked a lot with the environment. And about a year later, uh, we did this, the survey again, and this is what it looked like. So the majority of the org had shifted. And what's uh, fascinating about this is they don't have any product discovery coaches embedded in the teams, but the product discovery is happening. I mean, they have amazing designers and UX people, right? But they don't need product discovery coaches um, well, they could actually, any organization can use it, but it's happening. That's the point. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So the technical infrastructure, uh, I don't know how I'm doing on time, but I'm, I, th I think I'm over time. So like technical infrastructure, basically what this is about is do you have an outcome platform? Do you have a platform that allows you to learn to test easily, fast? Because um, if not, it's going to be really hard. The threshold for the teams to like, oh, we don't know if this is the case. Yeah, but it's harder to test it than to just deliver it. So let's just deliver it. Then they're not going to do it. So then you don't have this environment that's conducive to product discovery. So I thought I'd wrap things up with like a product discovery myth, myth busting. Um, so the first is like uh, you need these six week discovery sprints to do product discovery or two week discovery sprints. And that's not true. And some of the best teams I've seen, they, they don't even do sprints and they just do this continuously. Whenever they have something that they're not really sure about, they'll do this. And I've used the Jeff Patton's um, cost of prototype and confidence matrix as a way to help teams um, figure out whether, what their confidence level is and what the cost of their prototype could be. The second is like you need product coaches to get product discovery working in teams. And this one is, a little bit more complicated because if you have an environment that's conducive and you have a lot of uh, know-how about how to do it, product discovery coaches are great in the teams, like shoot them into the teams. They will inspire, they will, you know, help them figure out things. They will become better, faster. So here you, they make add a lot of value. If the, if the environment is not conducive and you don't have a lot of know-how, it's also great with them, but use them to tend to the environment. So this is kind of true and false, depending on if you use how you make use of your product discovery coaches. And finally, product discovery is a team activity. And uh, no, it's not. Like the entire company needs to be engaged in this from stakeholders to senior management to customer service. Like because it's about like the ecosystem, this maintainability, et cetera, et cetera. Like this is something that impacts everyone. That was it for me. Thank you a lot. Fantastic. Thank you, Victor. Uh, that was really insightful. And uh, Martin and Johanna's presentations as well. Uh, and now we have 23 questions. Um, and we have until quarter past seven. So I'm going to start posing some questions to the presenters. Um, so the first question is the one that's voted highest. Um, maybe pretty st straightforward to answer, but will you share the slides after the presentation? Of course. <laughs> yeah. Is, 
Yes. Yeah, perfect. Yes. All right. The first question um, of a different sort. I think it was posed to Martin. So why is it always uh, have to be a problem to solve? Could discovery be initiated by something else? Well, uh, sorry, it was Anastasia who, who asked that one, and I was almost about to send her a text. Uh, <laughs> I remember this one. Uh, two, two parts to this answer from me. Um, one part is they, what usually initiates stuff uh, in, in the company is someone coming up with an idea. Product management coming up with an idea in the shower. And, and just going, let's build this. And then I think it's really helpful to ask why. And, and why is usually, what, what kind of problem are we trying to solve? What need are we trying to, to uh, fulfill? What motivation does people have to buy this, to use this, uh, et cetera? So it doesn't have to be a problem, but it's usually something like need motivation, uh, market gap something along those lines and that was basically two parts in one that i was going to say uh, so that's how i see it of course you can uh, do something uh, from from uh, from yourself kind of from something that comes from from within you your company uh, but if this is going to be uh, sellable uh, and used by other people, uh, we need to look at them. And sure, uh, I'm guessing that Anastasia means that it, we don't have to call it the problem, uh, but I don't think I have any better work, so you can help me out from that one. Thank you for that, Martin. I have a question for Johanna by Victor. Uh, how do you ensure that your team's KPIs are, uh, are siloed enough so that they know that the effects they see aren't due to weather and wind or other teams, etc. Did you kind of catch that question? Um, I, when so, we set a metric, uh, most of the times we first we set a metric and then we try to work toward it towards it, and maybe then we could like um push it or iterate on it so it gets more concrete um but also i believe that that it could be um more departments that are working on the same uh, goal as well but was it more like uh, how you uh, doesn't see that that it um it's a conflict between experiments or it didn't actually understand the question that well, but. We can turn to another question though, uh, regarding SVT play. So what stakeholders were invited to the different workshops that you mentioned in your presentation? Uh, it was stakeholders from uh, marketing and from uh, editorial and um, uh, all of those that are some kind working on this service. So I believe that we were about 50 people uh, on those workshops that we had. So everyone that knows anything about SVT Play and, and could ship in. Yeah. Thank you for that, Johanna. Um, another question from Hannah. Um, a couple of examples of failures and the learnings from your experience of rolling out product discovery to, to teams. Um, I leave that open, whoever wants to kind of chip in. Come on, Victor, your turn. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the example that came, depends on what you mean with fail. I, I would say fail as in like it didn't stick. Um, so I was working with a network team, uh, like they were doing database, database centers and uh, network configurations. And you might think like, well, you know, it's like electricity in the wall. And that's the kind of the response I got. It's like, there's no discovery to, to do. You just make sure it's there. 
and I thought that there was a lot of discovery that could be done here. Like, how do people do people prefer to use Wi-Fi? Do they prefer to use this? Uh, do they want VPN or not VPN? There's a lot of discovery to do here. Who are your customers, and what kind of bandwidth do they need? When do they need it? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And so we talked a lot about this, but there, it just didn't stick. There was no interest in this. So I would say that from 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 that point of view, it's a failure. But it's also really in that case we were. It's really important that to respect where they are, and so we just didn't push forward because that wouldn't have been helpful either. So when teams aren't interested or open for it, that's fine. That has to be fine, and it's not. It's not something that the coach should push for. That's something that management needs to work with. Otherwise, you as a product discovery coach are going to create this tension and divide the team or you're going to destroy your relationship with the team. And so that's not good. And another question I think it was uh, for you. Do you have a small step environment suggestion to go from delivery to product autonomy? I, so I think that the, the, the product autonomy ladder, doing a survey in your org or, or your team or like a product, depending on like your value stream, your product, whatever it is, you, the way you chunk it, you can do that. And then you can have a conversation about like, what are some things that reduce it and what would we need to do to increase it? Just going from a C to a D can be a huge step. Like you don't cross those bridges without too fast. So that, that's one thing. Thank you for that. Um, are you recording this and then will it be shared afterwards so we can share? We call it. I, I kind of failed on that. So I, it's recording right now, but I don't know who started it. So it might be a little bit late, but you will have the slides anyway. Uh, so for the next speed up, I'll, I'll make sure to write a post on my screen to, to remember to start the recording. I started um, recording before we started. So. Uh, oh, you did? Go, yes. Martin. Go, Martin. <laughs> well done. Well done. Okay. A question for you then, Martin. Um, I think it was free. Uh, we'll see. Uh, is there ever a time where the three lanes, business users, feasibility, move at different speeds? We often leave, e.g., technical aspects to live. Uh, always, uh, <laughs> definitely. So, so this is this is uh, definitely uh, very contextual. Um, I worked with one company who did like the first lane first, and then they just had a handover to the second lane, and then they had a handover to the third lane. Very waterfall. Uh, very bad in many ways because they didn't have a feedback loop from from the technical people to the management uh, at all. Uh, but they did go through the product discovery framework, so so they did at least mitigate some biases and came some part along the way. And um, I think the key thing here is that. Um, this framework and and uh, uh, general product discovery principles and stuff doesn't help you to know that you've covered what you need to cover. That's always contextual. So you need to think a little bit so, uh, on your own that, okay, so now it's time for the technical part, but hey, have they the other people actually done the business and the user value uh, things correctly or should we go back? So if everyone thinks in that way, it doesn't matter if people are moving in different speeds. Great. Well, we have you on the line. Uh, there was a question regarding IKEA effect. Do you mind describing oh, yeah. that a little bit more? I think it was you who, who showed me uh, the IKEA effect the first time, Marcus. Uh, <laughs> he just nods. And but I, I don't remember that. No, uh, but we had this discussion. Um, so the IKEA effect is, is it's called the IKEA effect because uh, you built something on your own. It doesn't matter how crappy the quality is, you love it uh, and, and you will stick to it and you won't throw out your IKEA furniture because you built it yourself, basically. So, so uh, this, is, this is what I, the, the trap I went into when I started building one solution and I was like, yay, this is the perfect solution because I built it myself. And then I didn't tear it down and try another one or anything. Thank you for that. Um, can we see your cat, Victor? <laughs> okay. <laughs> I can, I can put, you, we can take another question and I'll just bring her up. Uh, let me see here. 
Okay, um, I think I get this question. So, Johanna, uh, uh, is a product discovery for new products or for new parts in the product as well? Um, and what would be the, the difference between those two cases? I think it could be for both, of course, if you are, if you have an old product and then you want to reinvent it and you, um, you want to go into new areas where you don't know stuff, you really don't know the user problem or need, then you actually need to um, do some experiments and you need to learn. I believe that it's, it's not that often that you actually know every part of the problem uh, and then that you also know the solution. So I should say that you, yeah, most of the time you, you do, do a small part of uh, the discovery phase mm. in everything you do. Yeah, it's ongoing. Yeah. Right. Um, and another question relating to uh, what you talked about with these workshops to define the roadmap. Um, such as the impact mapping workshop and things like that. So uh, how long were these workshops? So this it involved uh, a lot of people. Um, I believe that they were maybe one and a half up to two hours, maybe three hours some of them were. Marcus was with, was with me, <laughs> but uh, yeah, from one, one and a half up to three hours, I believe. Thank you for that. Uh, Victor, uh, a question for you, uh, not specifically, but um, uh, a question re regarding regulated environments. So how would product discovery work in regulated environments like hospital, gas and oil industry, you know, those, or I mean, finance is also regulated, but I guess it's a bit of an outlier in terms of regulation. So what do you think, Victor? Is, is there a difference? Um, I don't think that the, yeah, the, the so there are a few differences. Um, a big difference is when you roll it out. Like if you're making medical devices, etc., the testing needs to be more thorough. You can do product discovery and you can do a lot of discovery in different forms and shapes. Um, there's this one company that makes surgical equipment and they have their product owners and their teams in on operations sometimes. They have them looking at recorded surgeries they look at how the doctors use their equipment and that's a form of product discovery getting feedback um, also interviewing them afterwards like we were thinking about this and the, so the product discovery can be similar it needs to be adapted a little bit but then when you go into delivery that's where a huge shift happens where you might need you know you some companies have testing periods of a year because it's so regulated um, so I think you can make it work in regulated environments, but it all it requires you to set that up in a different way. Um, that's my short answer. I saw you were nodding, Martin. What are you yeah. thinking? <laughs> I agree. Uh, I, this is one of the reasons why I have the third lane, the feasibility lane uh, in, in uh, the framework I, I did. This is exactly what, what this is about. Um, you look at your capabilities and, you, uh, and your competencies, but you also, of course, look at uh, what kind of regulations do we have to follow, etc. So, so uh, uh, and when you know that, that can influence the, the rest of the product discovery. Uh, and you can realize these things that, that uh, Victor just said, that you need to have more thorough testing, etc. Et uh, so it's, um, it's a cross-pollination uh, uh, thinking. So if you only, this is something that I see a lot of people do, uh, and I've done it myself. If you only focus on like, let's, let's get good use value out of this, or let, let's get uh, uh, money uh, to the business, and you just skip the, the practical feasibility things, uh, such as, do we have the right people? Uh, do, we have, do, do we have to abide to any laws or rules? Etc. Uh, then you will get stuck in uh, one sense or another. You might release a product that don't get FDA approval, and well, yeah, that's waste. So, uh, so I would say 
when it comes to using the framework, thinking per discovery, thinking about the principles, asking the questions, it's in there. It works. When it comes to specific methods that we actually haven't talked about that much here, these were pretty general stuff, you have to know what kind of rules and regulations you need to follow. Thank you for that. And uh, a question now to all three speakers, um, because it's quite general. Um, it's from Anonymous. <laughs> have you found um, the upstream slash downstream discovery Kanban versus delivery Kanban framework to be useful to sync development and discovery activities? And I would like to expand this question a bit more, like using a Kanban um, to kind of visualize the work that we're doing in discovery versus the work that we're doing in delivery. So uh, I, I leave it open to you guys to kind of chime in on on um, your thoughts. And then there's silence. Mm -hmm. um, so for me, the first like question, how you, can you use product discovery in Kanban? Absolutely. Um, I've seen, I've, I've done it myself. We've used one board. I've seen another P, uh, PM do it and he had two boards. He had like a, a, a product discovery board followed by a, a product delivery board. And sometimes the things would move from one board to the other. And sometimes they would just go to the trash when they were in the validation phase. Uh, for me, the Kanban is like the way most, a lot of teams that I work with distinguish Kanban versus Scrum is just the time boxing. Like, do you have sprints or not? So sprintless product discovery, absolutely. That's that's my answer. Um, and you can have a really, really structured, thoughts? yeah. Sorry, you can have really, really okay, structured, go ahead. Uh, structured uh, product discovery as well. I mean, uh, older methods like the waterfall methods uh, have a really structured and strong actually product discovery. Uh, so so it's. I would say it's method or process agnostic or whatever you would call it. And a question from Uwe. How do you sell to management the time spent on discovery on behalf of delivery, given the insight from earlier in the presentation that there was so much focus on, on delivery, right? How do you sell to manage? Uh, any thoughts there, Johanna? I believe that you show them results on your learnings, quick results. Mm. I believe. And maybe if, if that is hard, uh, you just want to use like, if you can get some time to just try one um, kind of discovery with a small group of people or something like that. So you could show some good examples on your learnings. Yeah. So start small and then expand. Yeah. And show results early. Thank you. Any other thoughts from Martin and Victor? I totally agree. Pilot studies, undercover studies, start small. And uh, sometimes if you don't have access to that if you can't get that going like selling it i don't try to sell it to management but i try to uh, quantify the consequences of not doing it so it's really easy it is it's not really easy that's uh, the wrong way to say it. but it's fa it's fairly it's possible to when you're in organizations get access to a lot of data like for example how many features are we delivering how much is that impacting different types of metrics and you, and I haven't met one single management team that is that does not care about two things, uh, at least in Sweden. Um, they care about the employee well-being, they do, and they care about finances. Um, and when you find a way to combine the two, that becomes a very compelling argument. So if you can show that, look, we're delivering 10 features per week and no one, like, no one is tracking numbers, um, this is how they're being impacted. So, uh, and I saw one PM do this. He, he, um, he plotted like every release they had done and everything that, and, and their customer growth base. And then he tried to explain it through these um, different initiatives, but then it, it didn't make sense. However, when he looked at 
global um, index, like how the global index was growing, the customer base followed the global index directly. So then he, he was like, the things we're doing, do they really matter or not? And we and probably not. Like we would probably have seen a very similar without making all these delivery investments. Mm. So th there are some creative ways to figure out and, and describe this story about what's happening. Thank you. Uh, and now I leave it open to you guys. Uh, maybe you want to pose uh, some questions to each other. Um, and we have a couple of minutes left. Mm -hmm. Well, Johanna, uh, about SVT, um, if a team discovers that a feature is not adding value, but a PM or a PO or a management member really likes the feature, what happens? I, I think it could be a bit different in all of our teams, but if you ask me, yeah. uh, we don't release the feature mm. if it doesn't give some value to the customer. That's nice. Yeah. Oh, I have a question to you, to you guys. Uh, one of my uh, old colleagues uh, asked uh, a room of uh, product owners if they would ever uh, deleted a feature in their uh, in their uh, products, and no one actually said that they that they did, or someone said they did one, but not on a regular basis. And I've only found one company in Stockholm uh, actually doing this. Uh, and, and that is King, who have a lot of uh, control over their numbers, what features work or not. Have you seen any other examples of this? People actually prune the tree. We, uh, so I used to work at Spotify for mm -hmm. about four and a half years, and we did that a lot. Um, we, several teams that I were a part of, two teams that I were a part of actually killed one of their own products. Um, one came out of, we were doing one hour sprints and we were all exhausted after a full day of sprints. Um, and we discovered that this does actually not make sense. We were trying to solve a problem through the, and, and we were doing this focused one hour sprinting and like, no, actually this doesn't really make sense. And so they killed the product. Mm. But uh, I would say that Spotify is the only place where I've been that's done it so far. I killed some products too, Martin. <laughs> <laughs> Good. <laughs> then it's ending on a positive note, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> no, but that that would be the the. I mean, the for me, the ultimate uh, kind of uh, achievement in a product discovery uh, situation would be to realize the product has no value, uh, because then we won't waste anything on building it. Uh, maintaining it, uh, just beating the dead horse for years. That's what we want to avoid with this. But I also think there's a lot of like services and back-end back -end services and infrastructure being deprecated. And to mm -hmm. me, that's also one form of killing, killing oh, yeah. stuff. So, and I think that is much more common that, than killing customer features. Mm -hmm. um, True. I get inspired now. I'm jumping in, but um, you, you mentioned John Cutler before, and I think you know analogy that um, that he uses quite a bit is the the farm analogy that uh, you have a farm, um, but it's a family farm, and you want that farm to live on for generations, right? And you have to think really hard on you know what the types of things that you do in the farm because the, the ramifications will you know hit you in a year or two years. And it's about, you know, doing certain things, you know, fruiting, removing weeds, uh, uh, planting seedlings and things like that. So um, I think it's a nice analogy to talk about product discovery and product management um, that you have to think long term, like what's your vision, um, but you're planting seedlings right now. But what, what will happen to those seedlings in a few years from now? Uh, and what will happen to the other crops? So I... Um, I'm going to stop there. Um, so we ran out of time. Uh, thank you so much for uh, your presentations. It, it was really insightful. And uh, just to everyone, to reiterate, you're going to get the slides and you're going to get the recording. Thanks to, to Martin. 
And uh, like we mentioned um, in the beginning, this is a first in a series of product discovery meetups. So um, just go to the CRISP website. Uh, we're going to email you when there's a new meetup, etc., so we can continue the conversation and talk about product discovery and, and learn new things. So with that said, thank you very much to Johanna, Martin, and Victor. Um, this was great. So with that said, have a great rest of the evening. Thank, thank you. you. And bye. Bye. bye.